morning and welcome to the 18th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2018. Uh, we have already taken our first item uh, in private, but we will move on to item two in a moment. Can I ask everyone in the room to ensure that mobile phones are switched off or to silent? And uh, can I welcome to the committee our witnesses, but I will do that formally in just a moment. We have one other item uh, to deal with first, uh, which is uh, item two on our agenda, the consideration uh, of subordinate legislation. The first instrument is the Ethical Standards in Public Life, etc. Scotland Act 2000, ILF Scotland Order 2018. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Um, are there any comments or questions from members on this instrument? If there is not, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? That's agreed. Thank you very much. The second instrument is the National Health Service Free Prescriptions and Charges for Drugs and Appliances Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018. Again, there has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Persian Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Can I ask members if there are any comments on this instrument? If there are not, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? That's agreed. Thank you very much. We now move on to the third and substantive item on our agenda, which is consideration uh, of the budget for 2019-20 as our pre-budget scrutiny. And uh, may I formally welcome to the committee Paul Gray, Director General, uh, Health and Social Care and Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, Christine McLaughlin, Director of Health Finance, Shirley Rogers, Director uh, of Health Workforce and Strategic Change, Dr Catherine Calderwood, Chief Medical Officer, and Alison Taylor. Uh, head of Integration Division at the Scottish Government. Um, uh, I think we will move directly to questions if uh, the witnesses are content. And can I start simply by acknowledging the uh, progress that's been made in providing financial information to the committee and indeed making it publicly available uh, in the last few weeks. That's uh, very welcome. However, we would, of course, uh, wish to continue to engage uh, with uh, officials over the content and the format of these reports. This is new territory, I guess, in a sense, and uh, as I say, very welcome, but very keen to ensure that we continue to engage with you uh, on what is most useful to us uh, as a committee in scrutinising financial plans. And on the matter of financial plans, can I go straight to Ivan McKee for the first area of questioning? Thank you, convener. Good morning. A nice early start this morning. A nice, easy subject. Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk through um, the longer term projections on, on the budget. Now, clearly, we're moving into a, a different environment but with the medium term financial strategy in place. There's always been calls from um, the ground up, if you like, for more detail in terms of multi year budgets, etc. But clearly, there's a lot of variability around about that. And the medium term financial strategy lays it out fairly well. Um, it's kind of interesting if you um, if you look at the, the, some of the evidence we had on this. People were asking for they know 95%, but they don't know the last 5%. If you actually look at the numbers in the medium-term financial um, forecast uh, the, at that level, um, the, the government kind of knows 94% because there's nearly 6% variability around about the numbers as you get towards the end of that planning period. I suppose I'm interested to know is uh, um, your thoughts around that process what you think, um, uh, how accurate you think we, we need to be in terms of the numbers that we need to be planning that far out and whether the variability that exists in the medium-term financial um, strategy is something you can work with or do you think there needs to be more accuracy around about the data you've got going out three, four and five years? Thank you, Mr McKee. I'll, I'll bring Christine in a, in a second, if I may. I, <clears throat> I think Accuracy and precision are always to be desired, but in fact, um, running a public service is not an absolutely precise matter. So, for example, we had, um, as the committee will know, a serious outbreak of influenza earlier this year, um, starting before Christmas uh, and running into the new year. Um, now we may, you know, we may not have one of these every year, but there will be costs associated with that. So, so it would be a, it would be false to say that we can absolutely predict every element of demand. However, 
What is also important is that public bodies such as the health boards and also colleagues in local government with responsibility for integration have a degree of precision about what to expect. And we're always trying to, as it were, walk that balance between pretending we know exactly what the future holds because we don't, but giving sufficient precision to allow people to plan effectively. But uh, Christine McLaughlin could say more about the detail. So I, th I think the, the main thing that this allows us to do is come up with a reasonable set of assumptions and get agreement that they are the, the best set of assumptions at the time and then to work out the level of risk. And that's, that's I think, what the medium term the, the, the Scottish Government framework allows us to do, is to see where those risks and opportunities lie. Um, so I think that that's the strength in it and the, the ability to flex that as you get more certainty on particular components of it. I think the other thing that it shows when you come back to health and social care is the importance of, of two, two things. So one is the importance of a healthy population in looking at your economic um, outlook and also the contribution of health and social care to the economy. Um, so I think what's very clear is that we can't just look at the, the planning for health and social care in isolation. We need to think about the impacts on people's employability, um, on, on the workforce, um, on things like infrastructure development as we go. And the more that we can tie in health with things like education and, and justice to do that, the better position we'll be in. So I, I think it, it, it gets us into place where we join up all of these considerations in a better way going forward. OK. Um, and looking at the, the total numbers that are in there, I'm just to tap a couple of things. There's a two billion number talked about for increasing the health budget and cash terms over the lifetime of this parliament. And just for clarity, that's as a consequence of a manifesto commitment. Am I correct? Yeah. OK. So that, that gets that nailed down. Um, in terms of the... Um, clearly the, 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 the Scottish Government's budget could go either way, up or down, because we've got that band as we go further out. Um, now, obviously, you'll say that health could, could use more money if, if that does increase. Um, but what kind of scenario planning have you got round about, if there is some variability round about that? And I suppose that would be in the upside, given that that manifesto commitment is in place. So, so you're correct that the manifesto commitment is the, 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 the £2 billion pounds is what we've factored in. And, and as you're aware, we'll be publishing the medium-term financial framework for health and social care shortly. Um, and we've modelled it based on that manifesto commitment assumption. But I think, as Paul says, what it also demonstrates is that um, you could make different decisions based on your, your funding position, um, what that means for your ability to invest more in transformation and reform, I think, is probably the biggest thing, as well as potential impact on things like some of our major infrastructure developments over the coming five and ten year period. So I think we're ready to build up scenarios at the moment. What we're trying to set out is within the assumed funding levels for health and social care, what we think we're able to do within that, rather than explicitly look at scenarios where there is more or less. Um, but the tie into consequentials is obviously a, a different mm. position for health the health budget than there is for other aspects of the budget. So we need to be quite mindful of the, um, the, the fact that health and social care does make up the single largest proportion of the, the Scottish Government's budget. Yeah, so would you view the numbers that are in the, the medium-term financial strategy as being the base, if you like, that, and you would, up, you would see upside on that but not downside? Is that how you would look um, at it? That, that's certainly the basis on which we've developed the, the financial okay, framework for okay, health and social okay. care. And then the next question, I suppose, is our final question is around about consequentials on Barnet. Um, and whether or not, again, I don't know if you can answer this, but whether or not those are tied, because one way to look at this is if, if, if health spending in, in, in England varies, then the Barnet consequentials are going to vary. But the other way to look at it is, to some extent, the Scottish Government has insulated you from that because they've given you that commitment on the manifesto commitment. So, to some extent, that money goes into the, the big pot and then gets allocated depending on what the government's priorities are. Yeah. Is that kind of how you see it? Or do well, you see I guess these are... Some of the points you're making are matters for um, cabinet decisions course, about, yeah. about budget spend. The presumption to date has been that health consequentials from the UK government settlement will be passed on. Would be passed on. Resource consequentials right. are passed on. So that's the basis on which we've operated okay, today. Right. Clearly, if, if there's a scenario where there's potentially more funding, mm. then that would be part of the wider Scottish okay. government. Um, OK, but you wouldn't, and, uh, but, but on the other side, if there was downside from the consequentials, you wouldn't see that eating into your minimum number because that's kind of guaranteed. Well, in so long as the manifesto commitment is, okay. Um, okay. is is a solid assumption, and we're going on the basis that it that it is. But as you see, there's there's some volatility in the plans mm -hmm. going forward. But when you look at all of the different factors in it, I think that um, 
what's very up, up front in the, the Scottish Government um, document on the medium term financial outlook is that the, the two billion investment is the first thing on the on the list. So okay. to me, I think that shows the priority okay. that's given to okay. it. No, that's fine. And, and just my, my takeaway from that, interestingly, something we don't talk about enough, I think, is the comment you made about the feedback loop from health spending, supporting economic growth. Which yeah, I think it's is absolutely key. That maybe need to talk about more. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. And could you confirm for us when the health and social care delivery financial framework will be published? Uh, that's a matter for cabinet to decide, Mr. Macdonald. Uh, I, we uh, expect it to be published shortly, but it is a matter for cabinet. And in relation to the questions Christine McLaughlin just answered around Barnet consequentials, would I be correct to deduce from that? that Cabinet has not yet made a determination on the application of any future uh, Barnet consequentials over and above the £2 billion additional that has been already described? These are matters for Cabinet, and um, I, I, will, you know, I would take my direction from there. Understood. Kate Forbes, briefly. Uh, a brief supplementary further to Ivan's point, and in the interest of long-term planning, um, has the UK Government given any indication when it's setting um, or publishing its long-term health funding plans, which I understand they've promised in advance of the spending review this autumn? So, so we don't we don't have a, a, a date for that, and I haven't seen any um, firm detail yet coming through on that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, can we move on um, to uh, the question of regional uh, regionalisation and the consequences of that and how that will affect the uh, future financial planning? Um, one of the issues which became clear in the uh, discussion at the conveners group recently with the First Minister was uh, that she believes that regional uh, uh, in, uh, relationships will grow organically or should grow organically, but she also referred to there being different views on this. I wonder uh, if this is a matter which is simply evolving or is there a policy process which we should be aware of in financial terms? Um, <clears throat> Shirley Rogers in, in, in a second. I mean, one of the things that I want to be quite clear about is that we are already committed to regional planning and delivery, and there is a there is a governance structure in place for that, and there are uh, regional uh, plans in development, which uh, um, again will be available uh, once the financial framework is published. But Shirley, do you want to say a bit more about that regional planning and delivery process? I'm, I'm emphasising that it's not just planning, it's also delivery. I, th I think that's very important. Thanks, Paul. I think that's very important. Uh, the, the strategy for the delivery of health and social care has three elements, in fact, probably arguably more than three elements. There are, there are a number of things that are delivered nationally, there are, because that makes sense. There are a number of things that are delivered regionally, and that, I think, is something where there is an opportunity to be able to look at regional specialties in a particular way. And the, the thrust of the um, delivery planning um, methodology was to, in doing so, enable local delivery of those things that make sense to be delivered most locally. Um, I think the other thing that the committee would probably be interested in is that Whilst there is governance around that regional structure, they are also quite porous things. So clearly regions have boundaries, and you're not going to necessarily make somebody who lives at the outer edge of a region travel a long distance where they can skip over. So, for example, if we take Forth Valley as, a, as an example, um, and Fife as another, um, there are some things that go from Forth Valley into Glasgow, some things that go from Forth Valley into Edinburgh, if that makes sense. Um, and similarly with Fife to Tayside or Lothian, depending if uh, which that makes sense. So it, it, it was really an attempt to try and look from the patient's perspective to say what makes sense to have that delivered locally? What are the things that are sensible to do more collectively, more consistently across a regional basis? And then what are the things that are so infrequent or so very highly specialist that they make sense to deliver on a national basis. Those things are emerging. There is some governance to manage that process of emergence. So we have appointed implementation leads in the regions, as you'll be aware from previous conversations. There are um, development, developmental approaches that make sense to, to trial in particular, in particular regions. And we might come on to that later on when we're looking at some of the specifics of health, health challenges. Um, but it's designed to look at 
what is the process that is required by patients and where does it make best sense for that to be delivered in Scotland? Thank you. And, and in terms of lines of accountability for that development, how do we how does the government anticipate that uh, going forward? Each uh, accountable officer, uh, there's, a, there's an accountable officer in each health board, and that, that situation stands at the present time. Um, it is possible that in future we, we may also see um, a, an element of regional accountability, but as Shirley Rogers has explained, the first thing that we want to do is get the regional delivery in place. And then um, I have been discussing with the uh, board chief executives and the cabinet secretary has been discussing with the chairs the extent to which that will then require us over time to uh, uh, refine the way that we describe our current accountabilities. But the, this, you know, this year in, in, in particular, if I may just s stick to that, I mean, the, each of the chief executives remains an accountable officer and, and there's no immediate plan to change that. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Miles Briggs. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I think I'd start by, um, I think we welcome the fact the government's um, accepted the need for us to see monthly updates around budgeting from both the health boards and the IJBs, and I think that's a welcome uh, step forward. But I think actually knowing what's going on in some health boards has become more and more difficult for committee. Um, a couple of weeks ago, NHS Lothian said they would need £31 million to carry on delivering cabinet secretary clarified that they didn't and on friday they wrote to me to say that that's their position still so i just wondered and wanted to know do you think there's enough uh, or do you have confidence in the scottish government's financial monitoring of each board when we have this situation of not really knowing the true financial financial position um i do have confidence in it uh, mr briggs and, and i think what, what i would say about uh, lothian's position is that they have said that they need or would need, in their estimate, £31 million to continue to deliver as they were delivering uh, at a similar point last year. But, of course, the whole point of transformation is you don't carry on doing the same thing. And, and that's a point I've made in committee, uh, both here and in the, the, the audit committee before. Um, the, the sustainability of health and care services requires a, us to transform. And the advances that we have in uh, paths of treatment, paths of care, the advances that we have in the way that care can now be delivered much more locally through telehealth and telecare mean that if we simply say um, we need this much money to do what we did last year, that, that's not exactly a transformative approach. So what I'm encouraging health boards to do is, um, as they are doing, to engage fully with our transformation process. Part of that runs through the integration partnerships, and they're making an enormous contribution to that. The clinical community is making a contribution. So I think we, we need to take a more forward-looking approach to this, rather than saying if we had this much money, we could deliver in the same way as we did last year. But I don't know whether Christine or Shirley want to say more about that. Yeah, I I, I do have confidence. I, I um, have spent a lot of time working with NHS Lothian, for example, and understanding their position. Th th there is no doubt that, that boards, um, if every individual board is its own organisation and the reporting to individual NHS boards, if you look at the finance reports, are all slightly different in the way mm -hmm. in which they, they report. Um, but that's something that's evolved and, and fits within the board reporting within each area. What we do look for is principles about transparency and simplicity so that people can understand the key messages and particularly the risks. And I, I think Lothian, from what I've seen, I think Lothian do that. Um, the, as Paul said, the, the point about that particular question, I think, was not that that was a, a, a deficit in their current financial planning. It was a, um, a quantification of continuing to deliver as they are, which is, which is not... Um, in effect what we've asked them to do so if, if that doesn't clarify I'd be happy to follow up with anything that you feel you sure. need to but I, I have a level of confidence um, in, in the way that in which they're reporting into us on a monthly basis. Mm. And in terms of um, brokerage, which obviously some boards have received, and given the situation um, we saw in NHS Tayside, um, I think Ayrshire and Aaron have suggested that they may need brokerage. Is there any other boards you know of who are already uh, making requests around that? To pick that. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I'm happy to give you that. We, we had clarified it recently through the um, Public Audit Committee as well. So, the, um, we, we were 
I think, quite clear on the brokerage position for 2017-18, which has been confirmed for the boards. It's 50.7 million of brokerage in 17-18. Um, in developing the monthly report from um, June, my intention is to show very clearly boards who are signalling that, that there, there may be a brokerage requirement for 18-19, so you'll be able to see that very clearly. Um, I think what, what we do know just now is that the boards are currently in deficit. Um, we're, we're working with them on the basis that recovery will take more than one year. Um, and if, if we want to support them in terms of their delivery of performance and, and stability, then we accept that it will take more than one year. So I, I do expect that in 1819 we'll have further brokerage requirements, but we need to firm that up with boards. And, and I think also accept that that, that position will, will change through the year. Um, so I might expect it almost to be more prudent at the beginning of the year and for boards to make improvements through the year. So, so to, to get managed expectations, that is a number that I would expect will, will move through the year. I think what you're asking for is transparency about what that number is and to be able to see that on a regular basis. Supplementary on that point. Um, do you think does the need for brokerage reflect temporary problems or structural deficits that require fundamental action? I'll hand over to Christine in a second. Boards have an, have annualised budgets, as the committee knows, and uh, that's a matter that's uh, you know often considered by Audit Scotland and others as to whether um, you know that's the right thing. Brokerage allows us to flex over the end of financial years in a way which we couldn't otherwise if it was simply a question of saying that's the annualised budget and that's the end of it. So what we've been able to do with some boards is to give them a bit of flexibility over um, the, 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 the end of, of, of a financial year in a way which allows them to plan ahead for what, you know, what they need to do to recover. You're asking, does it does it imply some you know underlying structural issue? Mm -hmm. At this stage, I I I would not say that it does. Um, it, there are you know particular circumstances in different boards, which um, you know on, on the basis that they, they operate in different areas, so they serve different populations, um, will will come to light. But I do not think at the present I would have evidence to say that there is an underlying structural deficit in boards. I think uh, the, uh, one of the bases on which we provide brokerage is that the boards have a plan to recover sustainable financial balance. So you, you can't really have one without the other, if that makes sense. But I don't know if Christine wants to add. Can I, can I just say, in, in that case, does that mean that you anticipate where brokerage is arranged that that money will be repaid? That is the current situation. So that's, the, 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 the position is that these recovery plans are about having getting back to balance, but also uh, 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 re restoring, re restituting the government for the brokerage that's been received. That is correct. Thank you. Miles, were you done? Yeah, I, I just want to, in, in regard to then where boards are reporting that they're not able to reach efficiency savings, for example, uh, Glasgow and Clyde are reporting £44 million lower than planned. Um, what projections do you then factor in with that, given that um, some boards like uh, Tayside, for example, are looking to make over £200 million over the next five years as part of that recovery plan? And clearly boards who aren't currently asking for brokerage aren't achieving those. I'll hand over to Christine in a second, but just to take Glasgow as the example, since you've raised it, I mm -hmm. discussed the um, uh, position on, on Glasgow with the, the chair, John Brown, last week. And I think, as Christine has said, at the early part of the year, boards will um, make a set of prudent assumptions and continue to develop efficiency plans in the course of the year. Um, that's what we expect them to do. Uh, I think it comes back to... Um, uh, the point that Mr McKee was making earlier, that the, the capacity of anyone to make an absolutely perfect prediction at a point in time is fairly limited. And therefore, I think that you will see Greater Glasgow and Clyde bringing forward efficiencies in the course of the year, which will defray that £44 million to a point where they come into financial balance. Um, that's certainly the discussion I had with the chair. But Christine, I don't know if you want to pick that up. Yeah. In the so, so part. I, I think it. I, 
Just to state the obvious, that setting your, your budget isn't really something that just happens for a 12-month period and then you stop and start again for the next year. And So boards are continually looking for efficiency savings, um, either recurring savings and also I think we need to recognise that there will always be a component of one-off savings. Um, if you look at the figures in Glasgow, they are not dissimilar to the level of savings achieved in previous years. Um, and that's also the case with Lothian. So one of the factors that I would look at is whether the level of savings in a board is very different from the, the level that they've been able to achieve in, in previous years. Um, and I think the other thing to say is that you, you can't really just look at efficiency savings without looking at the, the transformational change plans as well, because the longer term sustainable answer is from, I, I think, through the, the reform of services as well as um, a core level of efficiency saving. So you, you really need to take the two together. The, the transformational change savings, as you know, t tend to have a longer tail in terms of the time frame, whereas you're looking for probably a 3% minimum of efficiency savings in a year. So, so I think for, for me, you need to look at the total picture. OK, thank you. Come back to regional matters again. Can you describe how regional initiatives will be funded and how that will be uh, held to account? Is it simply through partner boards? Um, no, and I'll, ask, I'll bring Shirley in in a second. There is, um, there is money uh, allocated visibly and transparently within the budget to transformation, but do you want to say something about that, Shirley? Um, yes, I mean, uh, I think the first thing that I would say is that the transformational plans are, are not just based around hope. There is significant support being given to the boards to help them with that transformational journey because they're quite difficult things. So if I take Lothian as an example, since Mr. Mr. Briggs has raised it, I met with the chief executive and some support work, um, some expertise around that that we can place into the board only last week. And there's um, discussions taking place this week around how we support the board to take those transformational decisions. Um, there is transformational funding available to help ease through certain things that will be transformative for the system. Um, so, for example, transformational plans around a digital platform for patient records, for example, which sounds like quite an administrative thing, but actually has a huge impact in things like waiting times and so on. So there's some, some funding around that. We're also, though, mindful of the fact that we operate with a £13 billion budget. And actually, the real gains to be made are not just about how we fund a bit of transformational funding for various things, but how we look with a transformational lens at all of that spend in the way that Christine was touching on earlier on around economic viability. The specific processes that we now have, um, plans from each of the regions and a plan from the consolidated national boards... Um, which are with us for consideration. There's a programme board approach that will look and work very, um, I hope, quite scientifically to look at those things that give us the biggest return on the investment for those transformations and where are things that are truly going to transform a service for patients rather than just a wee bit of change at the margins. And those financial packages will be allocated with quite a, a rigorous process of assessing their impact. Now, clearly, some of those impacts will be quite long-term, but some of them aren't. So making sure that the financial allocation that is given to those programmes of work actually achieve the things that are set out for. So that happens through Programme Board and ultimately through the Director-General as Accountable Officer for Spend. OK, thank you very much. Ash Denham. Thank you, Camino. Good morning to the panel. Um, the public uh, sector pay policy has already been set out for 2018-19. Um, but for NHS staff, the Scottish Government has also committed to providing a pay deal that's at least as generous as the one in England. And so the final pay deal in that sector might diverge a bit from the public sector pay policy. The Barnet consequentials for that for 2018-19 are set at £78 million. So I'm just wondering if there ends up being a more generous deal, has modelling been done around you know, any additional costs that might come from that? Um, to, to, yes. We've modelled on um, actual costs, we've modelled on consequentials to understand the, the variation. Um, I think also important to remember that there is a, a large chunk of staff for whom um, 
pay awards will, will not be associated with any consequential. So we're modelling the entire entirety of, of pay for NHS staff for, for independent contractors too. So it's, it's, it's an important factor, but it's one of many when we look at pay impacts for uh, 1819 and 1920. So do you have an estimate of what, that, what additional cost that might come to? Yeah, we, we've, we've worked out various scenarios on, on where we might end up with the pay um, policy, which includes um, which factors in consequentials. Okay, thank you. And are you going to tell us what those are? <laughs> it wasn't going to. <laughs> Clearly we're in the process of negotiating that pay award as we speak, so I'd really rather not, if you don't mind. It's always important to ask the question. <laughs> Um, can, can I uh, ask uh, now uh, Sandra White to raise the question? Much, and, uh, uh, good morning. Uh, it's already been mentioned that the largest part of the budget is health and social care, and obviously integration is a huge uh, part of that as well. Evidence we've received from integration authorities, some are saying it's working well, others are saying it's not, uh, but the most... And if you forgive me, I'm first time I've tried to use this without lots and lots of paper, uh, and I've actually got the right page as well. Uh, and basically, they're questioning about true integration. Uh, they worry about the fact that they have packages from that are labelled health, packages that are labelled social care, and they don't seem to meet in the middle. Uh, basically, so there's a, a number of questions I wanted to ask in regards to that, and just how efficient integration authorities can be. Uh, and one of the questions I wanted to ask is about the leadership of the integration authorities. Uh, are they sufficiently robust themselves to be able to question this, why they're only getting, as they, they seem to perceive, uh, the labels are still on them, and it's not true integration. Uh, whether the, you know the decisions are still being the funding decisions anyway are still being dictated by health and social care. Um, and there's another question in regards to the chief officers and finance officers that either associated with health boards or local authority, and wonder if that leads to a conflict of interest. So if I could throw those two questions out, and then maybe give you another couple of questions, that would okay. Thank you uh, for that. I'll bring Alison Taylor in in a second because she's the head of our integration division. I, I think, uh, first of all, um, if, if integration was working perfectly evenly across the whole of Scotland two years in, I would be very surprised indeed. I would think people were misleading us. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it's not exactly the same in every place is, is, exact, is as I would expect. Um, this year, on the 5th of July, we'll celebrate the 70th anniversary of the NHS, mm. and it's not perfect yet. So I wouldn't expect integration to be perfect in two years. Um, but what I would say in response to your point, uh, Ms White, is that uh, I think I can certainly see evidence of where it is working well um, staff in in that sense who are who are delivering the frontline services um, being identified uh, not with the NHS or with local government but with the service they provide so so for example um, my uh, mother benefited from the react team in West Lothian now that I, I deliberately asked her one day um, do you know do you know where they were from she said oh it's it's just react so there was nobody with a you know a local government badge or an NHS badge. It was simply the the, the professional that she needed for the care that that was appropriate for her. But yes, you're right. I mean, we are we are bringing together two cultures, if you like, the culture mm -hmm. of the health service and the culture of local government. What I'm very clear about is that certainly in the the, the colleagues that I speak to at, at chief officer and uh, chief executive level. Um, there's a real determination to ensure that that, that, that that bringing together of cultures is for the benefit of patient care rather than uh, detracting from it. And I know that there's work being done um, to support the leadership uh, that's provided through mm -hmm. chief officers. I think also your point about you know, if the chief officer is employed by the local authority mm. or, or, or by the health board, is that a problem? Well, many of the, the, these are, are joint appointments, in fact. So the chief officer for uh, Glasgow, for example, and the other chief officers in, in that area, um, sit on the health board as executive directors, mm -hmm. but also have a reporting line into the 
the, the, mm. the, the local authority through the partnership. So we are doing all we can to ensure that these <coughs> posts are, uh, your senior posts are, are general, genuinely have the right amount of power and authority and accountability and responsibility that's consistent with what they're asking to do. But Alison, could maybe say a bit more in response to your question? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, just to build on those points a little bit, I think when we talk to the people working in local partnerships, particularly the integrated teams mm -hmm. who are actually supporting people using services and their families, which is what it's all about, um, it, it's, it's encouraging, having been working on it for a few years, to hear people talk. Now, you know, obviously, they, they may be saying positive things to us to some extent, but they say the fact that this is a high agenda item that they have to work together, that they have to be integrated with one another, has made a real difference to how they approach working together. And it is in many places in its early stages, but in fact, we didn't even start from a level playing field. It's in some places, as members of the committee will know, people had been working in well-integrated ways for some time. In other places, there was a lot more to be done. Yeah. It's quite, quite an uneven starting point. At a sort of national level of monitoring progress, if you like, I think what's really encouraging is to see the early evidence, the early quantifiable evidence for these shifts in the balance of care that we've been looking for, and these are not without challenge. The points Paul makes about the joint accountability of the chief officers and the chief finance officers, th these are really key, I think, in structural terms in the systems we've created. Um, they don't get us past the fact that some of the decisions that need to be made are really difficult. And particularly as you go around reforming and reshaping services in the way that Christine and Shirley have been talking about, sometimes that involves quite challenging conversations with the public and with professionals. And I think the key thing is that people are around these decisions together in these arrangements. And that's what we need to support them through. The, the need to work together and lead together towards the sort of opportunities that Christine has described. Jay, thank you. Um, so basically you're saying you don't see a conflict of interest uh, in, the, in this particular aspect of people coming from health board and local authorities, but also sitting at that higher level because the experience they have. Is that, that what you're saying? There's not a conflict of interest there? No, I think, I think th there certainly shouldn't be. And as I say, they're, they're, they're deliberately designed as joint appointments so that the... the, the um, the health board and the local authority, in that sense, have, a, have an equal say, and there are um, locally elected members on the uh, on the integration joint boards to ensure that the local authority is um, represented there. And uh, again, using the Greater Glasgow and Clyde example, there are num quite a number of locally elected members on the health board, as in other health boards as well. Um, I, I'm absolutely not trying to put a, a council of perfection before the committee. There are, you know, there, there's a, we're on a journey and we're, we're, we're not at the end of it by any stretch. But I think we're, we're putting and have put the right components in place to make that journey a success. Mm -hmm. Just to pick up on, <clears throat> pick up on, on that particular point as well, uh, it's not all doom and gloom, as you say. There are some that are working very well and others that aren't quite integrated as we, we would like. And some of the evidence we heard was saying that basically uh, the integration authorities should have their own funding uh, basically directed to them. Uh, that was raised quite often in the evidence session in 22nd of May, I think it was. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on that, if they were to be given <clears throat> direct you know, monies uh, from health board and social care to them, and if that would help. And if that wasn't the case, is it better to stick with both got and, and see it through, or is there any other idea that could give integration authorities some funding? Okay, um, I'll bring both Christine and Alison in, and we'll, we'll try to be brief for the sake of the committee's time. The legislation is set up in a particular way, but but what lies behind that, I think, is a is a genuine and and persistent ambition to ensure that health and local government mm -hmm. and third sector partners have a joint ownership of integration. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, I, I actually think it's a good thing that, that money which is first allocated to the health board, in that sense, goes into the partnership arrangement, because that means a sustained commitment from the health board to the success of that partnership. It can't be described of or thought of as something that's over there in some way. It is actually core to the business of delivery of health and care services 
to people. And similarly for local government, I mean, I'm, I'm currently co-chairing a, a, a series of discussions with um, Sally Loudon from COSLA and uh, Joyce White and Andrew Kerr from local uh, government and with a number of chairs and chief executives and with um, uh, members of integration partnerships, so the elected members, to ensure that we do see health and social care integration as, as a complete picture and not divorced from the business of local government or health. And as I say, our, our third sector partners are, a, are an important component. Convener, do you want me to bring in more detail or do you want to? I'd be keen to explore the issue of accountability, given that this is, in a sense, a pre-budget focus. And so the, the question then is who would be accountable in the current scenario um, yeah. for funding of IGBs? OK. Um, so maybe Alison and Christine can come in and, uh, on that, and I'm happy to respond as necessary. OK. Uh OK, thank you, Christine. Well, the, the legislation around integration establishes these integration joint boards, as the committee knows, as statutory bodies. So the, the accountabilities for decision making um, are set out clearly there. There are um, requirements on both local authorities and their accountable officers and health boards and their accountable officers to fulfil their duties. And then what's done with the money once it's delegated to the IJB sits with the accountable officer of the integration joint board. So in that slightly technical sense, the accountabilities are set out. And in fact, that was a large part uh, of, the, of the drive for the legislation as it was set out, was to clarify those matters, because under the previous arrangements, which had relied on, on, on voluntary joint working, it was unclear and it frankly didn't work. It, it made some progress, but it didn't work as clearly as it needed to be. Christine, do you want to come in on the, on the financial management side of the question at this point? So it, the, the, the question you raise is one that, that I know I've given a lot of consideration to and um, we, we've got a finance development group that involves all of the relevant parties um, and that's one of the things that we've considered too. I think to, to, if you step back from it, that, that, that you need to draw a line somewhere if you're going to give somebody a resource that they're responsible for. Um, and I don't think anyone has yet come up with a way that feels... Um, better in some sense. There's, there's always going to be a pressure to understand what total resource you've, you've got and for it to come from somewhere. Um, and so even if you went down a different route, for instance, like giving a, a budget direct to the integration authorities, you would probably still have a mechanism where you would need to agree on any increases, any additional funding for something else. Um, and you would still have the, the, the reality that within that resource, you'd be looking to start to spend it on different things. So I think where we've got to so far is that the only way that this is going to work is by people coming together um, from those different sectors. And actually, the fact that the resources comes in from parent bodies shouldn't of itself be the barrier. I think sometimes it is put up as a barrier. And in those early years, it has felt like it. But I, I think the, what we all need to do is try to move on. Um, but, but the things that we can do to make it easier so we can take away some of the complexity about individual allocations that we give for different things and how that flows through. So I, I would accept there's more that we can do, but I haven't yet, and unless anyone has different ideas, I don't think we've yet come up with a way that feels like it takes away some of those issues about initial sources of funding. Yeah, yeah. NHS told us that they remained accountable for money spent, and so there's a question, I think, about clarity of accountability for all concerned. So. Uh, the, the way I would explain it, convener, is I mean, I'm the accountable officer for the whole of the health budget, regardless of who spends it. So it's my duty to ensure that there are systems of delegation in place that secure, um, first of all, clear um, allocation of funds, clear delegation of responsibilities. And then I expect the health board chief executive, as the accountable officer, to ensure that, that he or she has a clear system of delegation in place, both within the health board and in relation to the monies that are um, then delegated to the integration partnership. I know from speaking to local authority chief executive colleagues that they do the same. So, so there is a traceable line of, of, of delegation. But in the same way as I would say I still remain accountable for the whole of it, I would expect a health board chief executive to be accountable for everything that I have delegated to them. Part of that accountability will be discharged by delegating it further, but I don't think it, I don't think it erases their accountability. And moving on to a specific area within uh, this 
uh, which is around set-aside budgets, bringing them a harbour. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everybody. Um, we took evidence on May 22nd about set-aside, and I don't know if I'm any more clear about it, because I just read the official report again. But we heard about... Um, how some of the set aside it's hindering the processes for integration and uh, one panel member referred to set aside as a notional budget and I'm aware that Dumfries and Galloway and Argyll and Butte IJBs have chosen to allow the NHS boards to remain, uh, retain the set aside but technically the IJBs still um, direct where set aside should be spent. So. Are there examples that you know where set-aside budget is working effectively or um, does it support or hinder the process of integration? I mean, should we be doing something different with set-asides uh, and maybe making it a bit more understandable and clear for everybody? OK, so I'm, I'm just going to say a couple of things and then bring Christine and, and Alison in, if I may. Um, I think... Since we're talking about transparency, the transparent thing for me to say to the committee is there are a set of principles around how the set aside budget should work, but th there is there is a there is within health boards and local authorities and within the integration partnerships uh, there is genuinely a bit of a contested view about how that should work in practice. That's one of the reasons, in fact, that I convened this discussion with, with Solace, with COSLA, with the IGBs and with the chief officers and the chief executives and the chairs of the boards, because I think it's something that, that we need to work through. I don't propose at the moment to try to impose an, you know, an absolutely similar sy system in every area, because the whole point about you know, having local determination is that within the flexibilities available we should use that but it is i think it would be fair and transparent to acknowledge to the committee it is something we are still working through so there will there will be some differences of views exp expressed to you but maybe christine and, and, and alison could say a bit more about that and i should also record sorry just for 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 the committee's benefit the ministerial steering group jointly chaired by um, the cabinet secretary and peter johnson who's the health spokesperson in cosla is is also um, taking a very close interest in this so i think just to start off the the reason why it's um it, it it's managed in a different ways as hopefully you know is is that the this is about resources that are within existing broader resources so in a hospital it could be a ward or or proportions of wards so you know part of of um medical and uh, specialties for instance so it's not whole complete components of budgets and that's why it's been um established as a, a set aside budget but that doesn't mean that it's notional you know that these are real beds with real staff in them with real patients um and real costs so i think where, where i've got to in this and really helped through the, the finance development group and i think from some of the people that came to give evidence on the 22nd is that the most important thing is that when um integration authorities are setting out their um their their plans for services that it includes the component that is in that acute hospital care which is the set aside budget and if that happens i think everything else flows so it has to be more than just calculating a um, a budget. It's, it's got to be something that features in your your plans. And I think what we, we saw is that when you looked at Aberdeen City as an example that we used, that's exactly what they do. Um, now, it gets harder when you start to look at how you would um, shift resources if you provided that service differently. But we're already seeing some examples of that starting to happen. So we know that it, we know that it can. So it has... The, to me, the way it moves away from being something that's talked about as being notional is by as clearly being able to see that that um, acute component of care for um, the, those individuals is included within the plans. So if we, if we start from that as being the do you see that in every partnership, I think that would be a valid question. Um, because in all these things, the money flows, the money should flow based on your, your service delivery plans and not the other way around. I don't know if that sufficiently answers it. If Alison might want to add to that. The only thing I would add, if I may, is again, I think this takes us back slightly to, to what we were trying to do with this iteration of integration, because this, of course, builds on years of attempts to bring health and social care closer together. And one of the lessons from the community health partnership experience, which preceded this round of, um, of work, was that 
the community health partnerships had within their span of control only the services that were already in the community. So that was the, uh, th that was the maximum space within which they could reform anything. And one of the things that we recognised was that one of the challenges we're trying to address now is this um, potentially avoidable use of institutional care, sometimes in hospitals, sometimes in care homes, particularly for frail older people and others. And the only way that the new partnerships could get some grip on transforming that kind of care was if they had some authority over aspects of that kind of care. I think Eddie Fraser, when he gave evidence to the committee a couple of weeks ago, explained that what is in that component of the hospital budget that Christine describes is basically the types of activity in hospital that are most often used because something else hasn't kicked in earlier on in the community that would deliver a better outcome. So this is really... It grieves me slightly that we end up talking about set-aside so much, I completely understand why, but the set-aside is only a mechanism to enable this idea of shifting the balance of care by giving people that span of stuff to reform and improve that touches the thing we want to do less of as well as the thing we want to do more of. Thank you. I wonder in response to Ms Harper's question, and if it would be helpful to the committee, we could we could try to set out on a couple of sides of A4, not more, what we're trying to achieve through this set aside approach, because it, it, it is something that is, you know, off to debated, and I, I just wonder if it would help the committee if we tried to give you an outline. I, I think that's very welcome, and I think we would appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Um, when we took evidence last time, Judith Proctor said that cardiac nurses, rehab nurses, pulmonary rehab. If you're delivering that in the community, your set-aside budget, which is for acute care, would then help support transition for the community. So you'd have your cardiac rehab, pulmonary rehab delivered um, you know, in the community. So is that part of the process that would be seen as a good example? Yes, indeed. Because um, sometimes when we talk about shifting the balance of care, it, it takes us back to this earlier point, I think, that we need to see it as being part of a, a joint responsibility because... Um, it's part of a joint pool of resource, human and financial, and it might be that a different service is delivered by the same staff in a different place. That's shifting the balance of care too. That can greatly improve people's outcomes and experience of care, and it's a good example. Right, OK. OK, thanks. So just for clarity, if an IGB, through its activities, reduces uh, demand for hospital care, mm -hmm. does the finance released by that Lie, stay with the IGB, come, come back to the IGB through the budgetary arrangements, uh, and uh, are there any examples of that happening? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll put uh, this back to Alison in a second. The, the answer in principle is yes. The, the, the difficulty, and this is why there is this debate around this, is that it's a bit more complex than that. So, so imagine a service that is, is delivered um, at, at the moment in a hospital-based setting. And some of that service um, is, is then transferred into the community quite properly and with proper clinical governance and so forth. Um, but uh, just to make the example, uh, imagine that the, the, that hospital consisted of that one ward in which that service was delivered. You, you don't make the saving of being able to you know, remove the need for that hospital what, if you've only transferred half of what the ward did out into the community. And, and that's where some of the, the issue uh, uh, arises. It's the, absolutely the right thing to transfer it into the community. It's best for the patients, it's clinically appropriate. But, but actually realising that the efficiency saving is harder because you haven't, you haven't taken away a whole service, you've taken away part of it, and yet, therefore, the other part remains where it was. And that now, that that's not to say this is all impossible, and therefore, um, we should we, we we should stop trying to do it. But that's where some of the debate comes in about where the budget lies. Um, you, you 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 can't transfer half of the budget for a service into one place and leave the other half dangling. So that that that, and these are the things that need to be worked through. That's what we're doing through transformation. But it's just to make the point: it's, it's not altogether as simple as it may look on the surface. Okay, thanks very much. I look forward to, to the paper that you mentioned, Kate Forbes. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I want to talk about uh, budgets against outcomes because I understand there's a, a requirement for the integration authorities to report budgets against outcomes, but we've previously heard um, some questions about how successful uh, that is. So what support uh, are you, or the Scottish Government, currently providing to integration authorities to help them develop reporting of budgets against outcomes? Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll bring Alison in in a second. I think, that, of course, that some of the, 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 if you like, the high-level outcomes are set out in the legislation itself. And one of the things we've been keen to do is to help integration partnerships to have the necessary underpinning data to support both their analysis of what they should do, where they should prioritise, and then the outcomes they achieve. So within um, NHS National Services Scotland, there is uh, an organisation called the Local Improvement Support Team, which can actually give um, local partnerships access to data that is very, very much focused on their own area. So being able to identify in particular areas where the patients are that, that have the highest use uh, of, of health and care funding, because they're obviously the ones with the highest and most acute need. Now, because we've got some of that underpinning data already, then one of the things we can we are doing and can do to support them is to see whether these tre whether these trends are moving. So, are the highest um, highest use patients actually being given a better service nearer to home that's reducing their use usage rates? Outcomes um, are also the, the the other thing before I say before handing over to Alison. Outcomes are not only objective; they're also subjective. So, in other words, did, did the person feel that the quality of care was good is just as important to me as to whether we can, by some, if you like, some measurement, say that the quality of care was what it should have been. But mm. Alison, Could I add a quick supplementary sure. for handing over in terms of there must be activities too where it's not meaningful to split budgets across a range of outcomes. But I, I'll leave that to, for you to answer. Partic that's particularly in relation to the requirement to report financially. Yes. yes. Um, I'll, I'll add to what Paul has said about support to local partnerships, and I'll say a little bit about financial reporting, but I'll invite Christine also, if that's OK, to, to contribute on that. Um, thank you, Paul. The, the list teams, I think, are particularly well received by the partnerships. I think the fact that the analysts are embedded locally really helps. Um, they've put quite a lot of effort recently into, in particular, supporting clusters of GP practices as well as the health and social care teams, which I think is helping to knit together the idea of integrated planning and delivery and then understanding what you're, what you're getting. They're using... Um, a, a data set that we have been developing over some years with ISD, which links health and social care data, which is also potentially very powerful because it allows you to see patterns of service use, shifts in, in, and, and variation, enormous variation as well. The, the other layer in this um, that's more recent is the Ministerial Strategic Group, which Paul mentioned earlier, uh, about 15 months ago, wrote out to every integration <laughs> authority and asked them to share with us their historic and projected data against half a dozen key indicators. And these are things like um, occupy, unscheduled occupied bed use, which is a key point in the delivery plan, uh, balance of spend on palliative and end-of-life care, etc. We've been gathering this data on a quarterly basis. We have a working group for that as well. And it's beginning to illustrate for that ministerial group really interesting trends, both in terms of variation in how services are used and um, between areas, and in projections for ambition, which I think is quite interesting as well. The, the point that Paul makes about um, that which is quantifiable and that which is more qualitative is something that's on our minds a lot at the moment. I know when Janice Hewitt was here a couple of weeks ago, she, she asked why it is that we all tend to believe numbers but not narrative. And I think that's a particularly powerful question when you think about our commitment to double the availability of palliative and end-of-life care in communities, for instance, because it's actually quite hard to quantify at any level of granularity, just as an example, what constitutes really good palliative and end-of-life care. Um, it's even hard to know what to count all of the time. So there's a huge amount of work going on in this, and I think a key aspect of it is the uh, exchange that's underway between chief officers, between integration managers, between the list analysts, sharing experience and understanding more of 
what is afoot. When it comes to actually reporting financially against outcomes, I think we've given ourselves a hard task. And I think it's, it's a good objective, but making the link between outcomes which at their highest are set out in statute and then filter down to these indicators does risk um, a layer of granularity that actually isn't that meaningful, I think, as you suggest. But I think Christine knows more about the practicalities of that bit. Would you like me to give a bit more detail? So we're, I think we're, we're starting by trying to get the building blocks in, in place for it. So we are, we're looking at the expenditure in um, high level. So we're, we're spending on acute primary care, um, community, mental health and so on. Um, and you'll see that in, in the um, first report from integration authorities where they, they attempted to show mental health spend. And I think that shows one of the issues that that um, spend for something like, like that crosses um, the whole of the sector from primary care through to social care. So I think Sal says it's, it's important that we get that right. Um, and, and I think what we've seen so far is that not all of our information systems allow us to do that right now. So we are, we've already started and we're going to have to continue to invest in, um, in better costing information systems to allow us to pull that together. So I think on your kind of 80-20 rule, we can get probably about 80% of the way <coughs> without too much difficulty, but to really make it meaningful on a real-time basis, which is what partnerships really really want. You don't want something that's 18 months out of date before you get it, then we're going to have to invest to be able to do that in a meaningful way. So I think what, what we'll start with is those agreed national um, outcomes and look at things like reduction in, uh, in occupied bed days. And, and seek to translate that into what does that mean financially. Um, I, I think that's the best way to step into it. But we don't yet have a comprehensive programme budgeting approach across either health or social care right now. Mm. And just um, briefly on the, on the subject, I guess there's always a danger that having targets can distort behaviour. How do you ensure that doesn't happen? And secondly, as a supplementary, how do you um, enable um, better innovation when uh, a proportion of integration authority budgets are fixed, at least in the short term? Feel free to take issue with any of my premises. <laughs> oh, again, I'll bring Alison in. I, I, I think... We're very alert to the fact that, that, that targets can, in certain contexts, have effectively create perverse incentives. But um, on the other hand, uh, I always take the view that the public is entitled to know what to expect from a health and care system. Uh, you, you know, I mean, no one would no one would do business with a shop that had no prices on any of its goods, or at least if there is such a place, I've never been in it. Um, so the, the the idea that we would somehow not be able to say what somebody could expect from our health and care system, I think, would would be wrong. I think also the the, the way in which the um, objectives of health and social care have been set out in the legislation. Uh, is sufficiently high level to avoid that that you know perverse incentive risk, and one of the things we do each year is to look at um, to review the the plans from the integration partnerships and assure ourselves that they're um, both uh, deliverable and acceptable. So we have a number of mechanisms in place for that. I, I don't know if you had anything in. Per, uh, particular in mind where you thought there was a risk of a perverse incentive or whether it was just a general... No, not right. particularly. We heard, I think, was it last week or the week before, the comment that um, these comments that I've yeah. put to you. So it's more taking a comment that I'd previously yeah. heard from a, from panellists yeah. um, to for you to either rebut or to agree with. So, I mean, I don't know quite how far you want me to go on this one, convener, given time, but I mean, I can yeah, give you I a bit of... Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. probably... A, 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 brief, a brief response, Paul, would be helpful, and then we, we, will, we will want to move on. Aye, right, OK. So, um, one sentence from me, and then I'll, I'll bring Alison in for just <coughs> some, a, brief, a, a brief comment. A target such as the 95% A&E performance target 
you might say, well, what's that got to do with integration? Well, actually, what you've got outside the hospital makes a huge impact on what you have coming in through the front door and how, how people can get back out again quickly. It, does that create perverse incentives to behave in a particular way? Well, no, because it is a clinically appropriate target to have. And therefore, there are good clinical reasons behind it. The thing I would be looking for in any target, objective, outcome, or whatever it was, is it clinically appropriate? Does it benefit the patient? And if you can answer yes to these two questions, that seems to me to be what's important. I don't know if you want to add anything else. Only very briefly, a lot of the integration authorities have added in their own objectives. I'm not sure they would actually call them targets, but they're certainly not working to this half dozen that we're asking for data on for the MSG. Um, and so what they're doing is, I think in some instances, really very interesting, even talking with their communities about what constitute um, appropriate objectives, ambitions in, in their local system. Some of that is very new. I wouldn't describe it as, you know, um, well bedded in. But I think that matters as well. You can offset um, the balance of a centrally determined target by working on local objectives. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener. Um, thank you very much for your evidence this morning. I think, Mr. Gray, your earlier comments on on the fact that award may still be needed, um, you know, in terms of whether money would go back into the community and so on, so, was quite helpful. And I think it sounds as if you are agreeing with evidence we heard from Mr. Eddie Fraser of East Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership when he said the demand on acute services would be much greater if we weren't doing um, what we're doing, and with Professor John Connell who said society probably needs to move away from the idea of saving money um, when we look at this in the round. So I'd just like to focus on this idea of shifting the balance of care and ask, is the aim of spending at least 50%, is the aim of at least 50% of spending taking place in the community health service ambitious enough, given that in 2015-16 the data suggests that the level then was 47.7%? Was are yeah. we setting a high enough target here? So at the moment, um, we're making progress towards that target. I think the latest uh, data would suggest we're now over 49%. You're asking if it's ambitious enough. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would have no difficulty in discussing whether whether that target ought to be ex extended. And I wonder if, if I might ask um, Catherine Calder, the Chief Medical Officer, just to say a bit about shifting the balance of care in the context of, of realistic medicine. Thanks, Paul. The, um, I think we need first to remember that that target we're doing very well compared to other countries. If, if we look at the United States of America, their acute to community spend is 90% is acute and 10% in the community. So we are, we are in, in a way, already far ahead. I, I would agree that looking at that um, percentage of spend again when we've got so far is absolutely correct. And we now have, as you're aware, um, services like hospital at home in all of our health boards and what I hear from um, general practitioners is that, the, that their demand for those is a far greater than the capacity at the moment. So there, there is definitely um, more capacity we can put into some of the systems and as you know I, I'm sure already hospital at home while um, S uh, much preferred by the patients, of course, much preferred by their caregivers, and actually reduces prescription and reduces admission to both hospital at home itself, but also very much readmission to the acute hospitals. So it's 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 a, a service people prefer, but it's it's a win-win all round, including cost. Is that, is that capacity for hospital at home, for example? Um, you know, it sounds as if there isn't enough capacity at the moment. Is that a resource issue? Is that, there enough funding for this transition? So I, I think what people are doing, Alison, are becoming more um, ambitious with it. So over the winter, I visited the hospital at home service in the NHS Lanarkshire. They have space for 60 people at any one time. Because of the pressures on the hospital, they upped that to, to be caring for 90 people. They didn't know they could achieve that, and they did, and so they are now routinely caring for many more than 60. So I, th I think what's happened is people have really gained confidence in these services, that the, 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 the teams are getting bigger, there are, there are more um, staff being recruited, and 
I suppose part of this was, uh, this is new, were the patients going to like it? Do, do people's expectations? I think I need to be in hospital, how can I possibly get uh, antibiotics that will be as effective at home? How can I, uh, you know, there's, there's a concern, a conservatism, I suppose, that that care would be as, could be as good as in a, in a hospital bed. And of course, we're, we now have the data to prove that. Do you, do you think it's an achievement in its own simply to prevent a future shift to, towards more spending on acute services? Or are you looking for, for, for something more concrete than that? So, so I think we need to look at, uh, at patient preferences as a, a, and the difficulty with that is measuring that. I think we've already heard that from Alison. What we haven't got are robust um, ways of measuring how important pre patient preferences are. We, we know that the, that the outcomes can be changed by people having some, a, a, an option of, of different types of care. And I think we, worldwide we, we are struggling to find proxy measures even, to, to find how that patient experience can actually be measured in a meaningful way that we can adjust our services. But we are working on that. And I think that's where the, the measurement of realistic medicine with patient priorities, I, I'm always asked by audiences, how are you going to measure that? And I, I don't think we have a concrete answer. We, we're measuring proxy at the moment. So. Um, as we gain confidence in, in the patient experience being such an influencer, we, we need to work out ways of, using, of, of collecting data and using it. Okay. Um, on shifting the balance of care, our papers suggest that there's been a, uh, some modest, modest shifts in budget allocations um, over the three years of operations of the integrated authorities, um, and that family health and prescribing and social care budgets have reduced as a percentage of the total budget, and I just wonder if, if our witnesses might comment on that. You know, does that decline on spending and family health reflect the principles of shifting the balance of care to the community sector? Well, as I say, the, 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 the overall shift as, as counted is, 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 is showing an increase, and um, I think the proposed extra investment in, in primary care in particular, um, bringing that, that up to 11% of the budget over uh, over time is going to be another important component of that. I don't know, Christine, if you want to say a bit more about, about some of the, the individual components. Yeah, I think firstly, this is one of the areas that we'll hope to really set out very clearly in the in the financial framework, because the I think where we've got to is this is really about differential growth um, rather than seeing overall reductions. But if you take something like like prescribing, I think, is a good example where over the last few years we've seen really effective efficiencies in things like polypharmacy reviews, um, which have allowed us to really um, avoid the, the increases that we've seen in the past in primary care prescribing, where you've got um, hospital prescribing in, in some areas being around 10% inflationary growth um, in the last few years. So partly I think that reflects um, some fairly big increases within the hospital sector. So in some ways, maintaining that proportion of spend is, is something in itself. Um, to get to 50%, I think, takes more than just a, a marginal increase. It really does mean be able to keep that focus on um, both both shifting, but also making efficiencies in areas where you can. So um, I guess you would expect me to say that I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't want to stop anybody from generating efficiencies with an overall spend where they can. If you took that out of the equation, you'd probably have seen a greater overall growth level in, 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 in volumes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. David Stewart. Thank you. Give you a good morning. Can I raise uh, the issue around mental health spending? As you know, across Parliament, there uh, has been a lot of interest from MSPs about spending in mental health. And without being too simplistic, um, some evidence has been suggested historically this was seen as a more Cinderella service to physical care. Certainly what I was struck, uh, and evidence from integrated authorities, was the variation in spend from different uh, integrated authorities. For example, there was a reduction of 3.5% in mental health spending in borders and an increase of nearly 30% in Shetland. I'd be interested in the panel's views on why such a huge variation. I'll bring uh, Catherine in, in, in a second. I think what is clear is that, um, if you like, out-of-hospital spend on mental health is, is is an essential component of ensuring that that, that people can um, have 
a good quality of life in their communities. Your point about mental health being somewhat uh, a Cinderella service, I, I think that's, uh, to put it simply, I think that's recognised. Mm. And I think it's not right. Mm. Um, the fact that the government has appointed a minister for mental health, I think, is a very clear signal of, of, of the intent there. And the fact that we have a 10-year mental health strategy and are um, increasing funding on mental health is, is also a very clear signal of intent. Any individual is a, is a complete person. They have physical health and mental health. And the two interact with one another. You, can't, you don't have a separate mental health and physical health. It, one one, one mm. inevitably affects the other. And what we're also very clear about is that um, we're, we're, we're working with a wide range of partners to ensure that where people do present with issues that relate to their mental health, we're able to help them at the point of need. So I'm working closely with um, Police Scotland, for example, as are many others, on ensuring that if people present in police station custody suites, working with the prison service, people present in prison service settings. Um, I know that police officers often deal with what they call distress calls, which are in fact issues related to individuals' mental health rather than a crime having been committed. And we are very clear that, that, that we want to enhance our um, resources in these areas um, there's a significant additional investment over the next five years of, of 35 million, as I understand it, and working towards having 800 extra workers involved in mental health. So, so yes, it has been a service that I think has been undervalued. I think we're, try, we're, we're trying very hard, and not, not only symbolically, but practically with the input of money and people to turn that round to a valued service, because it's essential to people's mm. well-being. Say any more. I would agree entirely with that um, that summary, and that there's a there's a long list of reasons why mental health issues have not been um, uh, taken as uh, as seriously, probably, and also had the spend um, for care. I suppose I would summarise those in, the, in perhaps that we now recognise that everybody has mental health and well-being. Mm -hmm. Before we just talked about people who had mental health problems, uh -huh. mental health illness, and actually there's, there's a far greater recognition uh -huh. across society that, that, that that's a, an aspect of everybody's uh, lives. And, and Paul's comment about the, um, the police, uh, it, it's 25% of the police distress calls are actually caused by people with mental health issues, not, uh, not crimes. And, uh -huh. and, and th there is a lot of need for people to have understanding of how to deal with that. Uh -huh. And of course, that's not the right person to be dealing with, with somebody in a mental health crisis. With the um, no, increased knowledge, I think, that we also have about the, I don't like the term, the burden of disease, but our public health colleagues have recently published a very nice um, graph, which I will share with the committee. It's in my, my recent report, which talks about the burden of disease across Scotland. And what this committee would recognise is that cardiovascular disease and cancer are right up there as the um, as the top. So this is burden of disease as in premature mortality, early death, but also the burden of, of living with disease and disability mm -hmm. to people's lives that those cause. Mm -hmm. So you may be surprised to hear that, uh, that after cancer and cardiovascular disease, mental health issues and substance abuse are, is the third mm -hmm. largest mm -hmm. uh, um, a quantity of burden of disease as we are measuring that in Scotland. And I don't think that has been recognised. And that's certainly, if we were to place a map of the finance across that burden of disease graph, that, that, that the, the spend does not match that at all. I think that's very interesting, convener, that the, the issue that you relate to as well about the effect of, of stigma on mental health is very worrying. I remember, I think it was in the 1980s, the old Health Education and Health Promotion Council had a poster which said, um, six months after Mary had her nervous breakdown, her friends are still recovering, which I thought was a very interesting way of, uh, of putting the whole issue of stigma and the effect that has on health. Uh, Paul Gray mentioned the issue about the appointment of 800 uh, mental health workers. Could you perhaps give an outline of where we are in that? That was obviously over a five-year period. Where are we in the appointment of the 800 in Scotland? Sure. And I, again, I, I'd be happy to write to the committee in more detail on, on that. Um, we're obviously 
beginning that process just now. I think one of the things we're keen to see is that what, what we're not um, doing is saying that, that we're going to appoint 800 uh, doctors or nurses, you know, uh, for mental health. We will need more doctors and nurses and other um, cl clinical professionals, but there are also um, there's important investment in at the front line in counselling services. What we're also doing in schools. But if the committee would find it helpful, I'm I'm quite happy to give a more detailed exposition in right. writing rather than try to do it at length here. I think. A final question, I convene on conscious time, is I suppose just related to that, you, you mentioned earlier, Mr Gray, about the important issue about transformational spending. Yeah. Uh, how important is that in mental health and how do you work out how effective each pound is of spending that you're having across integrated authorities? Well, it, it, it begins by, by knowing what works. Um, that, that's really the, 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 the base point. And there are, there are some things that we know work in relation to uh, mental health issues. So, for example, um, in some cases, early access to talking therapies. We, we, you know, there's, there's strong evidence that that works. So the importance mm. is of making that available. But I don't know, Shirley, whether you want to say something about the transformational spend as it relates to mental health. I think that, that point is really the critical one, that what we're looking to try and achieve with the multidisciplinary team is to make sure that early intervention prevents escalation. Mm -hmm. So that the, the, the spend point becomes even more complicated because what, what you're looking for is both an achievement for that early intervention, but also trying to calculate what any failure to intervene appropriately at an early stage does in terms of clinical condition thereafter. Mm -hmm. The supplementary from Sandra Hood. Uh, thank you very much. I just wondered when you talk about the finance, is there any, when looking at the fact of CAMS, will there be a transitional period between CAMS and then adult services? This was raised with us, that there seems to be a gap there. We'd be, be looking at that perhaps, if you can even send a paper or an answer, yeah. it's, it's fine, but that was something that was raised uh, with us. Well. It, it, it's actually a very important clinical issue, so we, we can provide more in writing, but if, if you want a very brief answer, I'd ask the CMO to give that. Uh, and again, um, Ms White, I, th I think this has been something that hasn't been recognised before. We, we have traditional child and adolescent services and then adult services, and actually, as with some physical health services, that, that need for an active transition for a plan has not been recognised, but we, are, we have recognised that now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Alec Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much. Good morning to the panel. I'm very struck by Dr Calderwood's assessment that actually the third biggest strain on the health service is actually around substance use and mental health. I'm very concerned that given that reality, the 27 million uplift that the Scottish Government announced to mental health won't even wash the face of the 800 link workers that we've got to point, let alone deliver that transformational um, uplift. Now, I want to focus, though, on, on substance use because one of the most alarming outcomes that we've um, talked about and drilled down into is the is the increase in drug related deaths and the fact that we are now the worst in Western Europe for drug related deaths and do doesn't show much sign of improvement that there is no direct causal relationship to the the loss in ADP funding I'm uh, you know I've tried to make that stand up you can't say for definite that that's related but surely it didn't help now very gratified to see the government acting on that with the 20 million but there will be lost institutional memory and experienced staff who've gone out the door as a result of the closure of the services that happened as a result of the cost um, have any decisions been made about the allocation of that 20 million pounds of funding um, and how will the efficacy uh, of it in, in terms of impact on drug related deaths be measured you understand that Christine, have you, you, you've so got that. I can provide more details, but just by way of, of funding, the, we're working on the basis that the majority of that 20 million will go via um, integration, will go from health boards to integration authorities, um, and with, with a component of that being held back as a kind of investment fund. Um, so that and that will support the new strategy that's due out in the summer on um, substance misuse. So, so there is a refreshed ap approach to that, and I think what. Um, what we're looking for is for that money to be invested in a way that will get the best <coughs> and the highest impact rather than just going back to 
fund programmes, as you say, that were there in, in the past. A lot of the work, is, I'm sure you've, you'll have heard from the, um, the team so far, has been looking at how we really get the, the best services across the country and a level of consistency that maybe wasn't there in the past. So that's, that's a broad approach. Um, we can send you the letter. That a funding letter has just gone out, is, is my understanding, <coughs> to partnerships and boards in the last week. So we can make sure that you've got that and provide any further information on what happens between now and the strategy being published. Can I just ask, if that's being washed through, if that twenty million is being washed through integration authorities, um, how will it be protected for drug and alcohol services? Because there are obviously competing demands within yep. IGBs. So I think it's probably important to note both on mental health and on ATP spend that they are areas where we've been directive about protecting spend. So we expect this spend to be over and above. Um, the, the core spend, particularly in mental health, we said we expect the, the additional funds in mental health to be over and above real terms increases in base budgets. So that picture that you've, sh that, that you've got there from 16-17 into 17-18, we, we were not expecting to see that when we look at the 18-19 figures. Um, I have to come back to you on that once we've got the data, but that's, <coughs> that's the evidence we'll be looking for through the year. To, can I just ask for one very brief supplementary? And if IJBs <coughs> don't protect the money, because we've seen that before, they were told to protect the money when the original 23% cut happened, and yet we saw in Edinburgh a 1.3 million cut to ADB services. What happens if they don't protect the money? So, so we'll be looking at the team to understand the extent to which the strategy is being implemented. So I, I guess, to be fair, you also need to understand whether an area has been able to, to deliver what it needs to um, with less funds. Um, if it's a case of actually reduction in spend and not delivering outcomes, then you would expect us to take action as we would with any area of performance. So we're, we're, I think the thing to be assured of is that it's an area of real priority and we'll be focused on understanding how that money is invested. And very finally, <coughs> Brian Whittle. Thank you, community. Just, just on, on the, 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 the alcohol and drug um, uh, funding there, a, a lot of that is a lot of the, the sort of services that are delivered through the third sector, and I suppose we could say the, the, the same in mental health as well. And I just wondered what, how that, as that money washes through, is, is, is there going to be a, a sort of link between NHS services and third sector in terms of working together? Well, I'm in no doubt that third sector services are absolutely essential for the delivery of, of appropriate interventions on mental health, um, partly to do with the way that they're trusted in communities and probably have access to areas where, where frankly, statutory services would be, would, would be less trusted and people would be much less likely to access them. So, from my perspective, I would, I would be... You know, I would have a strong expectation that the integration partnerships will be working with the with with, with local services, some of which might be quite small, uh, and and therefore um, you know we, we we want to be absolutely sure that that they have certainty about about the resources available to them, so that they can continue to to, to provide local services. Okay. Thank you very much, and can I thank the witnesses for that session? Clearly, there are a number of items on which you have already volunteered uh, to provide further information, which is always welcome, uh, but we may drop you a line uh, if there are other items the committee require further assistance with at this time. But thank you very much. We'll suspend for five minutes.
Thank you, colleagues. We will uh, now resume and move on to the next item on the agenda, uh, which is consideration of an affirmative instrument. The first instrument we are looking at today is the Community Care, Personal Care and Nursing Care Scotland Amendment No. 2 Regulations 2018. Uh, we will hear, uh, first of all, from uh, colleagues from the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities in just a moment, and thereafter from the Cabinet Secretary and her advisors. Uh, and then, following uh, the question sessions with witnesses, we will then move directly uh, to debate on the instrument. Can I welcome to the committee Councillor Peter Johnson, the Health and Social Care spokesperson, John Wood, the Chief Officer for Health and Social Care at COSLA, and Maura Johnson, Director of Financial and Business Services at Glasgow City Council, also representing COSLA. Uh, and can I start uh, by asking uh, Peter Johnson uh, if he would lay out the uh, views of the of COSLA regarding this instrument and uh, your approach to the principal and any particular issues you wish to draw the attention of the committee to. Well, thank you, Chair Fisway, for inviting COSLA to give evidence today. As I hope is clear from our written submission, COSLA is happy to provide support for the extension of free personal care to under 65s. However, we believe that this cannot be done successfully without the cooperation of local authorities. In previous written submissions, COSWA has suggested that a staged implementation might be worth consideration. This morning, I would wish to make absolutely clear that COSWA accepts Minister's desire to have full implementation by April 2019 and to stress our absolute commitment to making this timetable a reality. Before we perhaps take detailed questions, it's worth me perhaps reflecting on the views of the COSWA Health and Social Care Board, which has agreed to uphold the principle of charging for some social care services on the basis that it's fair that people who can afford to pay a charge or contribution towards the cost of care services they receive should do. We believe that co-payment encourages ownership and empowers a person's ability to make choices with regard to the care they receive. Furthermore, the ability to use income raised through charges to invest in social care services is a key to providing local authorities with the flexibility to focus resources on local priorities and needs. I understand that COSWA officials are working with civil servants and partner organisations to develop the detail of implementation, and we do have some areas of concern which we hope can be addressed prior to implementation. Firstly, we would advocate that the policy must be fully funded with, with new money to service current service levels, the increased number of assessments required together with unmet need which will be identified as the policy begins to be implemented. Secondly, we would argue that this should not come at any detriment to Council's decision on charging for non-personal care in line with the COSWA charging policy. The autonomy Councils currently have, we would argue, strongly must be maintained. And finally, the implementation should be closely monitored with agreement to reflect any increase in demand in future financial settlements. Finally, I would emphasise again that COSWA gives our full support to the Scottish Government's policy intent of removing the current discrimination which exists and to extend free personal care entitlement to those adults under 65 years of age who are assessed as needing personal care. Um, so that's a quick whirlwind through the, the, the COSWA policy statements. Thank, thank you very you, much. That's very helpful. Can I ask Miles Briggs? Thank you, thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. And thank you for um, the submission, because I think it was quite helpful in, in setting some of the, the background information. It's about a year since I um, tried to bring forward my Members' Bill to Parliament, so I'm pleased that we've seen this progress, and, and hopefully today we'll, we'll be able to uh, pass the legislation uh, needed. But I think in terms of costing, that was one of the sides which I, I'm still not completely clear where the government have, have found the £10 million figure. So I wondered in terms of your work with local authorities, um, meeting that unmet need, which clearly is going to come from this policy, um, how much do you personally think uh, that this will cost? Yeah, so there's a, a figure of, I think, 10 to £11 million, um, that's been mooted and that's based um, on r removing the current charges that do apply to under 65s and, and nothing else. Um, it doesn't take into consideration the potential increased demand that would flow from charges being removed. Um, so we, we're actually we're working with civil servants at the moment um, to try and bottom out what those costs would be. Certainly we anticipate they'd go beyond the 11 million figure um, at, through the implementation advisory group. Uh, over the next couple of months, we would hope to get clarity on that. There have been uh, in initial estimates um, 
which would suggest that it, probably at least three times um, that 11 million figure. Um, but we still need to do a lot of that, that detailed work to, to have confidence in any sort of figure. Yeah, that's very helpful. And I think when, you know, some of the um, the work I did around the bill actually suggested a sort of 40 to 60 million pounds um, costing at that point. Um, in terms of scoping unmet need, uh, what work has already been undertaken by local authorities? So, we, so we've done this in conjunction with civil servants as well. Um, it's been a collaborative exercise, so I wouldn't say it was just us that have been doing that scoping work. Uh, we've essentially modelled it on the trends um, that emerged after free personal care for over 65s um, was no longer charged for in 2002, I think, um, and, and applied those trends uh, to, uh, to the current figures for under 65s. That probably wouldn't necessarily flow as a direct comparison, um, and so there's been a bit of modelling um, that, that, um, that probably tempers the, the increase that, that would be predicted if you applied the exact same um, trajectory. Um, and, and those, again, are the sort of figures that we want to just do a bit more detail on over the next few months uh, to, to get clarity. And, and you are confident then, in terms of you, in your statement, you raised some concerns around full extra assessments and administrative costs mm -hmm. around that. And you're still confident, though, that we can uh, put this policy in place in April of next year for everyone in Scotland, as the government's looking to, to see? Mm -hmm. It's certainly what we're working towards. Can I just add, I mean, um, COSLA has worked with government over a number of such policies and we've, the principle of fully funding is core to this, but we've always managed to work these things through, at least in health and social care, and come up with the desired outcome and we're confident we can do this in this, this field likewise. That's very helpful. And can I take it that funding includes the funding required for staff to make assessments of those not currently identified as in need of this case. Certainly what, we, what we'll be um, pressing for, absolutely. I think Councillor Johnson's point about that um, additional burden um, flowing from the assessments needs to be taken into consideration. Excellent. That's very helpful. And can I thank you very much for uh, your attendance this morning and for your input. It has been very useful for the committee to understand your uh, position, which has evolved as uh, these things often do. Uh, and unless there are further questions from committee colleagues, uh, we will adjourn briefly to allow a change of witnesses. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, colleagues. We will now resume consideration of the Community Care, Personal Care and Nursing Care Scotland Amendment Number 2 regulations. Uh, and I'm pleased to welcome this morning the Cabinet Secretary, who is accompanied by uh, Mike Little from Adult Social Care Policy Team and Anne Davis, Solicitor. Uh, I believe, Cabinet Secretary, you're going to make a, a brief statement about this, reg uh, this uh, uh, instrument. Well, thank you. Good morning, uh, Convener. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak briefly to the Committee about these uh, amending uh, regulations. This amendment will introduce free personal care to adults under the age of 65 from the 1st of April 2019 by removing the requirement of age as stated within the current regulations. The draft affirmative regulations before the committee today reflect our continued commitment to remove the differentiation and treatment of those under the age of 65 in the provision of free personal care. The committee will, I'm sure, want to join with me in recognising the tireless campaigning from Amanda Copel to bring about Frank's law. Free personal care already benefits around 78,000 older people in Scotland in their own homes and in care homes, enables them to receive free of charge hands-on care, such as washing, dressing, shaving and assistance with preparation of food. Of course, doesn't include wider social care elements such as uh, daycare. From the, the 1st of April 2019, personal care will be made uh, available free of charge across Scotland for everyone who requires it. For those on the lowest incomes and with the smallest levels of assets, personal care is already provided free and will continue to be provided. We recognise that those people with substantial packages of non-personal care will stay, still pay towards those elements of their care packages, but they will continue to have access to those social care resources that they receive now. We are aware that there are a range of opinions around the charging policies of local authorities, but we must balance the, the best outcome with the appropriate timing of implementing the legislation. Therefore, we have asked for this order to be considered significantly ahead of its coming into force date of the 1st of April 2019 to enable local authorities to plan for necessary changes to their processes and systems around care assessments and financial assessments. In preparation for the extension, an implementation advisory group has been set up, making use of expertise from local authorities, health and social care partnerships, COSLA, care providers and service users, to ensure that implementation takes into account the impact of this change on local authority systems. These uh, areas will uh, be required to be reviewed by local authorities to ensure changes to the systems will be in a manner that is sensitive to the needs of the service users and service user choices about their care and support, as well as aiding the local authority. The Implementation Advisory Group is also looking at models of monitoring and review of the policy, which will aid Scottish Government and local authorities to budget for future costs of the extension of free personal care. I'm happy to take questions on the regulations. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And I think uh, your, your final reference to the costs of, of implementation clearly is an important one. Uh, we heard this morning from COSLA, from Councillor Peter Johnson of COSLA, who indicated how uh, keen local authorities are to work with the government on implementation according to the timetable that's been set out. I wonder, um, uh, towards that end, uh, if you would like to comment regarding the estimated costs of implementation, which uh, currently, in COSLA's view, uh, uh, re reflect uh, existing need and not the potential for uh, unmet need that has yet to be identified. Well, Clearly, as, as Cosa said earlier, these are matters that are being discussed by the Implementation Advisory Group. Uh, those will be brought to a conclusion over the, the next uh, few months. Uh, there is a recognition that we know that the cost of existing uh, service users to be around the t 10 to 11 million, but it's trying to estimate that unmet need that's the, uh, the more challenging aspect of that. And that's why we're working through the Implementation Advisory Group to get the, the best um, estimate of that and ensure that, uh, therefore, going forward, that local authorities can be uh, properly supported in implementing this policy. So those discussions will reach a, a conclusion um, uh, over the, the next period of time, well in advance of the implementation date. Thank you very much. Is the principle that Cosley laid out for us this morning of 
uh, fully funded implementation, one that in principle the government uh, supports? Yes, yes, we do. But of course, there's then a discussion about well, what does that mean and what are the, the costs? And we need to land that accurately and then we need to review it to make sure that that's accurate. So going forward, we will make sure that the, the review of the, once we see the, the actual levels of unmet uh, need, uh, make sure that that's in line with the resources that have been provided. So we need to have proper monitoring of the policy as it's implemented. Okay, thank you very much. I'll call Hamilton. Just a very quick question on that, Cabinet Secretary, if I may. I think I asked you about this when we talked about the um, government uplift to the cost of free personal care for the elderly uh, last year or around the budget scrutiny. And I think it was something like 1.8%. And this was in the year that the same budget had a 3% uplift for all public sector workers. And my concern is that we are not attaching the value to this line of work that we should be, and as such, not making it uh, an incentivised profession to enter. What is your view on that? Oh, I, I don't agree with that. I think we have uh, the latest figure of the resources that we've put into social care more generally is around £550 million. Pounds. So in addition to the uplift of the free personal nursing care policy itself, there is the additional resources that have gone into, for example, de delivering the living wage uh, to uh, around 40,000 social care workers. So I think you have to take that spend in the round. Um, it is a significant investment in social care. Uh, Demand, though, continues to increase, um, and we have uh, we are the only part of the UK to implement free personal care for for uh, for older uh, people, and of course, we'll be the only part to implement it for those who are under 65. So, I think all in all, we have a. A system that is much fairer. Um, it's not perfect, but we have a system that is much fairer, uh, and uh, we will this next um, instalment, if you like, of extending free personal care. I think will make the the system uh, even more fairer. And as I said earlier, in the earlier answer, it, uh, we need to make sure that in taking that forward, we uh, properly resource that, and that is a discussion that we're continuing to have. Uh, Alison Johnson. Thank you, um, I certainly welcome this step forward, but um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Scotland against the care tax still have concerns. They're concerned about the fact that not all parts of a person support package uh, will be covered by personal care, and they'd like to see a rebate for people which would help to reduce the overall cost for people aged under 65. Um, for that whole support package. Is this something the government will consider in any review? So I, I think it's important to separate out the, the different elements. I mean, this um, is about the extension of free personal nursing care to be in line with the, uh, those who are over 65. I do recognise, though, that, that what Scotland Against the Care Tax are saying is that they want a, a discussion about uh, care charging more generally. And obviously, in their view, they've put forward a proposition about uh, removing charges across the board. Now, obviously, that would come at significant cost. Um, and that is a separate discussion around uh, charging policy and the cost of that to the discussion we're having here today. What we do recognise, though, is that there's a need to make sure that for example, when free personal care is implemented for the under 65s, that there's not then an additional uh, rise in charges for non-personal care. And those are part of the discussions that, um, that uh, are being had around the table in the, uh, in the implementation uh, advisory group, because I think that's important that, um, that there is a, a fairness there that doesn't uh, give on the one hand uh, um, and then take away on the other. So those are important discussions uh, to be had. Um, but you know, the, it, it is also, I think, in recognition of trying to make charging fairer that we took the decision previously to the cost of £11 million to raise the threshold for charging, which applies to non-personal care as well, uh, which has benefited a lot of uh, those who are on lower incomes and, indeed, the changes we made to, to veterans to disregard war pensions and, armed and, and, and the Armed Forces Compensation Scheme to, again, uh, which is, assists veterans with uh, personal and non-personal care. So we have taken those additional steps um, but we do recognise the issues raised, but those are for a, 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 a separate discussion um, uh, rather than this one. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will know of my personal interest in this, given that um, I wanted to bring forward a bill. So I'm pleased that we've reached today um, in almost less than a year since that bill was proposed. And also, I hope today's a good day, not only for Parliament, but for people out in Scotland who need this. And I think that's uh, where the cross-party support for this has really been important. And I think, you know, looking towards how we implement this, it's so important. What we just heard from COSLA is they now suggest three times uh, what's currently been proposed financially. They also highlighted uh, concerns around full costs of extra assessment and administrative costs. And so I just want to really uh, say to the government and to the Cabinet Secretary, I hope that we're able to make sure there's flexibility around this additional funding which will be needed, um, because we, I hopefully uh, will not see a situation where we um, try to do this on the cheap. And I think it's important that this unmet need, which we're all now aware of, is met and that's scoped as soon as possible. So in these two points, I'd just like some clarity in terms of uh, the concerns COSLA's raised um, for, for the full assessments which will needed and additional administrative, administrative costs they'll face. Well, as part of the work of the implementation advisory group, as well as looking at the estimates of unmet need, of course, they're also looking at the costs of implementation, whether that's additional staffing requirements for uh, assessment and administration. And uh, at the end of that process, we will agree uh, with COSLA what the, the global resources that will be required to fully and successfully implement this policy from the 1st of April 2019. We will then, of course, bring that forward. Uh, in a budget to Parliament and I hope we get the same cross-party support for the budget that will actually deliver this policy because clearly that will be important when we get to, to that stage. And do you have a timetable for when that figure will be? Well, work is ongoing on it. Um, we would hope to conclude those discussions over the course of the, the summer, um, but I think it's important to get it right. And if there's a <coughs> requirement for additional work beyond that, then you know it's important to get it right and get the best uh, estimate. Uh, so, you know, as, as COSA said, they, you know, progress is being made, um, and we would hope that uh, certainly over the next few weeks, uh, and certainly well before the implementation of the policy on the 1st of April, we'll have those figures nailed down. What I am happy to do, convener, is to is to furnish the committee with uh, that further information once it becomes available out of the implementation advisory group. Helpful, thank you. Okay, okay uh, Sandra Hart. Thank you, convener. It was almost the same as Miles Briggs question in regards to uh, ongoing funding and how it affects local authorities. But I wanted to go a wee bit further than that uh, and seek some clarification. Mm -hmm. We've obviously taken evidence in the health and social care integration, and this obviously will have uh, a knock-on effect uh, on, on this. But how will that be implemented? And we're talking about funding that local authorities are asking for. Uh, will social work and health integration of a part to play in this particular you know policy well the success of the implementation of the policy is is really in the the integrated space because for many service users they will rec they'll receive a range of services mm -hmm. that span uh, health and social care and it's important that the packages uh, of support that people receive are are uh, are knitted together well across health and social care and I think integration has helped to make sure that we've got away from the old debates around you know is it a medical bath or a social bath and whose budget is it to actually what's important is the, pa the package of care that is required mm -hmm. so in the same way um, at the moment that you know resources flow through into the uh, integrated joint boards to deliver those services then the this the same will be true um, of resources associated with this policy uh, so uh, I think that you know it is equally as important as it is for free personal nursing care for the over 65s as it, as it will be for the under 65s that this is seen through an, an integrated lens in terms of the actual delivery of, of services mm -hmm. to, to people in in their own homes thank you it's more about the budget but you answered that particular point in regards budgets okay. thank you Thank you very much. If there are no further questions from members, we will move to agenda item number five, which is uh, the formal debate on the affirmative instrument on which we have just taken evidence. I'll remind colleagues that this is a, 
a formal parliamentary debate. There will be no questions to the Minister and there will be no contributions from officials. Uh, but I would invite the Cabinet Secretary uh, to begin the debate by moving motion S5M12210. Uh, I move uh, the, the, the Health and Social Support Committee sorry, recommends that the Community Care, Personal Care and Nursing Care Scotland Amendment to Regulations 2018 be approved. Thank you very much. Can I invite any members who wish to contribute to the debate on this matter? Alison Johnson. Um, yes, um, thank you. Having led uh, Green Party members' business um, on the issue of social care in April 2017, um, where I was calling for social care to be free at the point of need, regardless of age or condition, and funded through progressive taxation. Um, I very much welcome this amendment to the community care regulations, but I do think it's important to put on the record that we could and should go further. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's recognition of the issue that there will be uh, some people whose social care charges will not end. Um, and Scotland Against the Care Tax continues to call for an end to all social care charges um, because they, you know, they, they inform us in their briefing that only this will remove the current discrimination against disabled people where they're charged for the essential support they need to enjoy the same human rights as anyone else. Um, I think providing free personal care to under 65s in the same way as it's currently done will still leave the vast majority of younger adults facing significant charges to receive the social care they need for independent living. So what I do welcome this morning's progress is a step in the right direction, but we can and should go further. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Can I invite any other colleagues who wish to make a contribution to the debate? Um, I see none, so if I may ask the Cabinet Secretary to sum up and... Uh, yeah, uh, well, th thanks uh, for the uh, contribution. Uh, can I just say to uh, Alison Johnson, and more widely, I, I do recognise uh, these issues. However, I think it's important to also make the point that uh, in Scotland, we have continued support through, for example, ind the Independent Living Fund, which actually we're going to come on to uh, discuss in a, in a moment. That is not the case uh, elsewhere. Um, in fact, um, it was the programme was stopped in England and Wales have also just stopped ILF. And of course, that is a really important source of support for people who, particularly young uh, at disabled adults who uh, enables them to live full independent lives in their own homes. So, you know, we shouldn't see this in isolation. There are other supports that we provide that are not provided elsewhere um, that, you know, do help people to, to maintain their independence. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate. The motion, uh, the question is that the motion S5M12210 be approved. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Thank you very much. I will suspend very briefly to allow a change of witness. Colleagues, we will now resume uh, and I welcome again the Cabinet Secretary and also Anne Davis from the Government Solicitors uh, Service. Uh, 
We are now looking at to further affirmative instruments. These are the Equality Act 2010 Specific Duties Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018 in draft and the ILF Scotland Miscellaneous Listings Order 2018 in draft. We will now move to questions on these instruments and I would uh, uh, invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement. Thanks, uh, Convener. While the instruments being brought forward uh, to the committee today are largely technical in nature, I'd like to provide just a little bit of background and context to their purpose. As the committee will be aware, the Independent Living Fund, or ILF, was a UK scheme making care payments to severely disabled people. The scheme was closed to new applicants in April 2010 and ceased to operate on the 30th of June 2015. The Scottish Government made a commitment to maintain ILF payments in Scotland and established ILF Scotland from the 1st of July 2015. This fund makes payments to all persons in Scotland remaining eligible who previously received funding from ILF prior to its closure. The funding is used by recipients for services that offer the flexibility they may not otherwise have to live in their own home, take up employment or education and help reduce social isolation. An agreement has also been reached uh, for ILF Scotland to distribute packages of ILF support to existing recipients of the ILF fund living in Northern Ireland on behalf of the Northern Ireland, Ireland Executive. In addition to existing ILF users, the Scottish Ministers have committed a total of £5 million annually in order to extend the reach of ILF in Scotland. And in December 2017, the ILF Scotland Transition Fund opened to new users. The new fund supports young people aged 16 to 21 living with disabilities to be more independent during their transition from education and children's services. 200 applications have been received since opening access to these payments, with a total liability of around £600,000. When ILF Scotland was established in 2015, it was decided that this should be as a company limited by guarantee. This was to meet the very tight time frame for delivery and to ensure that payments were protected. There was insufficient time then to list ILF Scotland in various pieces of legislation as a public body. In discussion with the Scottish Government legal director and public bodies officials, we have identified a number of pieces of legislation within which we consider that ILF Scotland should be listed in order to ensure that ILF Scotland is operating in line with other public bodies in Scotland. The two instruments being considered today, the ILF Scotland Miscellaneous Listings Order 2018 and the Equality Act 2010 Specific Duty Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018, achieve this alongside a third instrument which is not being considered today, the Ethical Standards in Public Life etc. Scotland Act 2000, ILF Scotland Order 2018, SSI 2018-148, which is subject to negative procedure. If the committee would allow I provide very brief detail of the two instruments being considered today. The ILF Scotland Miscellaneous Listing Order 2018 lists ILF Scotland in a number of pieces of legislation. In Schedule 1 of the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002, although ILF Scotland is already bound by this Act, by listing ILF Scotland they become subject to the duties relating to climate change contained in Part 4 of the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009. In Schedule 2 of the Public Appointments and Public Bodies etc. Scotland Act 2003, the purpose of listing ILF Scotland is to regulate appointments made by Scottish Ministers to the ILF Scotland Board by requiring that the Sco that Scottish Ministers comply with the Code of Practice for ministerial appointments to public bodies in Scotland. In Part 3 of Schedule 19 of the Equality Act 2010, so that ILF Scotland are required to comply with the public sector equality duty. In the Schedule of the Public Records Scotland Act 2011, which will require ILF Scotland to manage its public records in accordance with a record management plan which has been agreed by the Keeper of the Records of Scotland. And finally, in Schedules 1, 3 and 4 of the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014, listing in these schedules means that ILF Scotland will be subject to the duties of public authorities in relation to UNCRC and will become a listed authority in relation to children's plans and a corporate par parent. Finally, the purpose of the Equality Act 2010 Specific Duty Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018 is to add ILF Scotland to the Equality Act 2010 Specific Duty Scotland Regulations 2012. This makes ILF Scotland subject to various duties, including assessing the impact of new or revised policies and practice on the needs set out in the public sector equality duty, reporting on mainstreaming equality, publishing information on the gender pay gap and equal pay, and taking account of the equality quality duty in the context of procurement. Convener, I move these instruments and I'm happy to answer any questions that members may have.
Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, for a very comprehensive uh, run through the purpose of these two orders. The Cabinet Secretary will be pleased to know that we considered the third instrument, the negative instrument, earlier this morning and agreed it. However, um, we, will, we will come to each of the two affirmative instruments in turn in just a moment. But first of all, can I ask colleagues if there are any questions on either of the affirmative instruments which the Cabinet Secretary has described in the last few minutes? If there being none, Cabinet Secretary, we will then move again to uh, take these in a formal way. We will, have, however, take them uh, separately. Uh, and again, the same applies as previously. But I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to move, first of all, motion S5M12402. Um, I so move. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Does anyone wish to make any contribution in debate on this instrument? If not, the question is that this motion be approved. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, may I now ask the Cabinet Secretary to move the motion S5M12404. So moved. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Are there any uh, contributions that members of the committee wish to make in debate of this instrument? There being none, the question is, is this motion agreed? It is agreed. Thank you very much. And uh, we will now suspend. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for her attendance and suspend and move into private session. Thank you very much.